Welcome to the service of worship hosted here at the First Presbyterian Church of New Haven, Connecticut. It is good to gather as the people of God to worship God, even if our gathering is of our hearts and our spirits, while our bodies are apart. Now, before we join our voices together in the call to worship, I want to share with you a couple of announcements. This past Monday, Several of us in the congregation, and even our general presbyter, Shannon Vanso Campo, we began the 30-day anti-racism challenge. Guided by the program set out by the anti-racism table, and in collaboration with, the, with an organization called Interwoven Congregations, we are spending the next 10 weeks engaging in the work of dismantling racism. And we're doing this alongside of folks that hail from Connecticut and Delaware, California, Florida, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Missouri, Ohio, Texas, Virginia, Washington, D.C., Washington State, and even folks in South Africa. And I'm sharing with you this again because if you are interested, it's not too late to sign up. It's not too late to join us in this work. To register for the challenge, you can click on the link that can be found in the weekly email that comes out on Thursdays, or you can Google the anti-racism, the anti-racist table to go directly to their site and sign up there. Now, I will say that once you register, it can be a little tricky to get to the course, but I invite you to stick with it. You'll find it. And believe me, it will be worth it. I'm just three days into the challenge and already I'm changed for the better. Also, when you do sign up for the challenge, be sure to let me know too. Within our church community, those of us who are participating are gathering in small groups and we want you to be a part of that as well. Now, I did mention the weekly email and if, I, I wanna say that if you don't already receive the e weekly email but would like to, please do email us at the office and let us know. You can reach us at office at fpcnh.org. Our weekly email is chock full of pertinent information regarding the ways that you can participate in the ministry of Jesus Christ in the world today. And whether you've been a member for years and years or you've only just attended with us this week, whether you're a resident of New Haven or you live hours away or even time zones away, whether you're a lifelong Presbyterian or you just recently learned how to say the word, whether you are black, white, Latin Latinx, Middle Eastern, Asian, whether you are a citizen of this country or another, whether you are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or straight, no matter the pronouns you prefer to use, you are welcome here. And you are invited to fully participate in the life of this congregation. Just let us know who you are, and we'll be sure to get you added to our list and keep you up to date and included in all of the communications and activities of the life of this congregation. Now, I invite you to take a breath and get comfortable. Have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, a cup of whatever might make you feel comfortable. Feel free to light a candle nearby, collect some flowers, sit in some sunlight, create a worshipful space around you, and join your heart with mine as together we join our voices in the call to worship. The buzz of the world interrupts our lives and fills our ears. Call us into your way of life, O oh God. The complaints of others settle in our mind and cloud our vision. Lead us into your vision of life, O oh God cries of the poor, the oppressed, and the outcast pierce our hearts. Guide us in your example of living for others, O oh God. Fill our hearts, fill our eyes, fill our ears with your love, O oh God. Let us be your hands and feet in the world, O oh God. Come, let us worship God.
As God's beloved children, we are invited to come to our God with the fullness of our lives, to admit our love and to admit our hate, to admit our faith and to admit our fear, trusting in God's mercy and confident in God's ability to redeem. Let us prepare our hearts to hear God's word today by praying a prayer of honesty. First, we will pray in silence, and then we will pray together a prayer of confession. Let us pray. Holy God, when we fail to respond to your call with faith, forgive us. Forgive us when we are shackled by our narrow understandings of discipleship and our clouded sense of purpose. Forgive us when we are frightened of the future or pull back from the demand of your calling. Forgive us when we are rigid in belief and behavior when we lack nuance and grace in the practice of our faith. Forgive us when we fail to sense your presence in our past, to acknowledge your grace in the present moment, and to trust you for our future. Forgive us our sins, O God, and restore us with your mercy. Through Christ we pray. Church, the God who challenges us is also the God who encourages us. The God who confronts us is also the God who accepts us. Be assured that God is with us even now, accepting, guiding, and forgiving. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. scripture reading today comes to us from the book of Proverbs. We're continuing our study of the book of Proverbs, uh, and so we'll be picking up our lesson with Proverbs 7, um, verse 10, reading through 27. And you might remember last week was a bit of a curious portion, and um, this one continues on. So let us listen for God's word through these words of wisdom. Then a woman comes towards him, decked out like a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward, her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, and at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him, and with impudent face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. I have decked my couch with coverings, colored spreads of Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. He will not come home until full moon. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. Right away, he follows her and goes like an ox to the slaughter. 
or bounds like a stag towards the trap until an arrow pierces its entrails. He is like a bird rushing into a snare, not knowing that it will cost him his life. And now, my children, listen to me. Be attentive to the words of my mouth. Do not let your hearts turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for many are those she has laid low, and numerous are her victims. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Thanks be to God for these words of wisdom found in our book of Proverbs. Learning to drive a car is an exciting time in life. I remember when my dad took me to the high school parking lot and let me get into the driver's seat for the first time. It was exhilarating, a little nerve wracking all at the same time. I imagine it was for my dad too, although definitely more nerve wracking than exhilarating for him. Learning to drive a car is about feeling the car, understanding that a car isn't a toy, that it's heavy machinery. It's important to learn the rules of the road, being mindful of the speed limits and what the symbols all of the signs mean, but it's also about reading the road, about reacting to surroundings, being mindful that there are other cars on the road too. It's not just about my safety on the road, but I'm responsible for the safety of other people too. And when we do that, Everyone has a better chance of getting to their destinations safely. A former parishioner of mine, his now adult daughter has autism spectrum disorder and he shared with me that when he was teaching her to drive a car, rather than teach her the rules of the road, the rules of driving, he taught her to be predictable. For her, rules were hard and fast. If the speed limit is 65, she would drive 65 miles an hour. Rather than teach her the speed limit as a hard and fast rule, he taught her to be predictable to other drivers. If the rest of traffic is moving at 74 miles an hour, well, she can move at that speed too to stay with the flow of traffic, and she would be more predictable to the other drivers around her. While it's important to stay between the lines, if she sees other cars ahead swerving to give way for a stranded motorist changing a tire, well, she might need to swerve too. Swerving would be predictable to other drivers in this instance. Be predictable, he taught her when she was learning to drive. And I keep thinking about that lesson. Even these many years later, I'm finding many, many more applications of this lesson actually that go beyond driving a car. Be predictable. Be predictable. Today, we're continuing our study of the Gospel of Luke, and we'll pick up the story at the beginning of the sixth chapter. Up to this point in his ministry, Jesus has called a few disciples and has been teaching all over, traveling from city to city, from village to village. The crowds around him are growing, and more and more people are paying attention to what he is saying and doing. He has healed many who have experienced illness. He has cast out demons from people, leaving them healed and whole again. He's helped fishermen catch more fish than they've ever caught before. Some know that he's the Messiah. Others are wondering. Some are worried that he might threaten their power or position. And our text for this morning picks up with Jesus and his followers on the move, walking from one place to another to share the good news. So I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 1 through 16, and let us listen for God's holy word. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, center our minds on your love. Through your word, help us to understand how we might be predictable in our faith, predictable in our following Jesus. Reveal to us the way. 
through Christ we pray. Amen. So we're looking at Luke 6, 1 through 16. One Sabbath, while Jesus was going through the cornfields, his disciples plucked some heads of grain, rubbed them in their hands, and ate them. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the, man, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched Jesus to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath, so that they may find an accusation against him. Even though he knew what they were thinking, Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, Come and stand here. The man got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to destroy it? After looking around at all of them, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury, the Pharisees, the scribes. They were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now during those days, Jesus went out to the mountain to go and pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. And when day came, Jesus called his disciples and chose 12 of them whom he also named Apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and his brother Andrew, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was also called the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, so Jesus is on the move from place to place, and people are following. Some are following because he has invited them to come with him, and some are following because they are so genuinely curious about what he is saying and doing that they can't help but follow. Others in the crowd are following with more of a suspicious curiosity. They want to know what he's up to. They want to find his flaw. So they follow, hoping to trip him up. And the first scene of our text for this morning raises this last group to the fore. The Pharisees among the crowd, they see one or two folks that they know to be loyal to Jesus pluck some heads of grain in the field where they were walking. They rub the freshly plucked grain between their hands. Grain emerges and they eat the grain. And the religious leaders, well, they murmur to each other. So, oh yeah. Oh yeah, I saw it. I saw them pluck that right out of the ground and force it from its shell. Yeah, yeah, it's the Sabbath. I know. They should have thought about what they were going to do to eat today. They should have thought about that yesterday, like we did. They're caught. Caught red-handed. Okay, let's go see what he has to say about that. So they hustle up. They hustle up through the crowd and they tell Jesus what they saw. They say, your disciples back there, they were just picking grain, eating it. They were just eating it just now. You know that it's the Sabbath. You call yourself a religious leader? How could you let them do that? How could you? And reminding them of the story of David and his troops, Jesus says, yeah, today is the day for honoring the Lord. The Sabbath is a day set aside to honor and love God, to study God's word, and to reflect on the ways we live a life honoring to the God of life. Is that not what they're doing? Is that not what they're doing? 
And a week or a couple of weeks later, Jesus is teaching in a house of worship, <clears throat> and the congregation is a mix of his followers, some locals who are curious and faithful, and also some who are feeling threatened by his teachings. There's also a man present with a withered hand, and the Pharisees again murmur to one another knowingly, yeah, I see it. I wonder if he's going to try to make that guy's hand better. If he does, we've got him. That's it. There's no way that he can get away with that. No way. And Jesus sees the Pharisees' glare of disapproval, and he sees the man with the withered hand, and he invites the injured man to come forward. Jesus then turns to the crowd and teaches. And he says, what do you know of the Sabbath? Do you know that it is a time set aside for God? It is a time that we focus not on the busyness of our lives nor its daily tasks. Instead, it's time to honor God, to recognize God's presence among us, to learn from Scripture and from one another the stories of the people of God throughout the ages, to practice devotion to the God of all creation, to the God of love, the God of hope. This time is important. It's what brings us here today. And I ask you, what do you know of the love of God? Do you know that it is steadfast and endures forever? Do you know that it is gracious and merciful? Do you know that it is healing and brings peace? And do you know that we too are called to share God's love with one another? So I ask you, here's a neighbor who has suffered mightily. He's in pain. He isn't able to use his hand. Would it be honoring to God to leave this man in pain for another day? Or would it be honoring to God to heal and restore him? Leaving a pregnant pause for the crowd to consider his questions, he then answers for them. He turns to the man and he asks him to stretch out his hand and the man does. And the religious leaders are enraged, enraged. Reflecting on this scene, I cannot help but hear the voice of Jesus through the mouth of my former parishioner. Be predictable. Be predictable. In our passage for this morning, Jesus offers, offered nuance and insight about the practice of faith. Like when you transition from asking your child to do specific chores around the house to teaching them to look around and see how they can help in the house, Jesus introduced a new approach to a living faith. Moving beyond following rules and specific tasks, he introduced the idea that piety, religiosity, faithful living is dynamic and relational. Using the Sabbath as an example, Jesus expanded their imaginations and ours to consider its purpose and its place within a life of faith. The Sabbath is a time to honor God. It is vital to a life of faithfulness to set time aside dedicated to God, time to study God's word, to be aware of God's provision for life. And Jesus also suggests that we be predictable in our faithful living. This means that sometimes we'll need to feed the hungry or help the suffering on a Sabbath. It means that sometimes we'll have to swerve to protect the stranded motorist on the side of the road. And if we're honest, this nuance, this maturity and faithful living, it's difficult for us to practice more like the Pharisees than the disciples in this story, we in the Christian church in the U.S., we are much more comfortable creating and abiding by clear rules and regulations than we are living predictably according to love. In each generation, we craft rules and regulations with laser focus to identify who is worthy and who is against God's will. Who can obtain power and who cannot? Who is righteous and who is not? For example, 
those of us participating in the 30-day anti-racism challenge, we learned this week that initially, when slavery began in what would become the United States, according to British law, it was forbidden to enslave a Christian. Most African persons practiced Islam or other African folk religions, so white Christians felt enslaving non-Christian Africans was merely a matter of business, not faith. Viewing Africans as heathens, valuable only as property. Eventually, enslaved people began converting to Christianity, but rather than see their property as children of God, as baptized in the same waters as themselves, rather than do the predictable thing of abiding by Jesus' teachings to let the oppressed go free. The white Christian church went back to the drawing board on the rules and regulations. Much like the Pharisees focused on the Sabbath and disregarded the hungry and the suffering in our scripture passage this morning, 17th century white Christians in the U.S. became laser focused on one expression of faith, evangelism. This resulted in an ideology that affirmed the enslavement of black people by claiming that slavery was a righteous institution that allowed for the souls of Africans to be saved. By 1667, the colony of Virginia declared that Christian baptism did not exempt enslaved black people from bondage. And lest you, lest you believe that this is a Southern Church issue and not our own, New York and Maryland soon did the same. So what does this mean for us today? As Christians today in a predominantly white church, in a predominantly white denomination, we stand in a stream of generations of tradition. Traditions that have left people hungry and suffering on the Sabbath, Traditions that upheld slavery for the sake of evangelism. Traditions that excluded gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people for the sake of purity. This is part of our legacy. And it is also true that we are followers of Jesus. And we are capable of heeding Christ's call to be more predictable. To be more predictable in our practice of faith as individuals and as a community, predictable in our commitment to love, in our commitment to mercy, in our commitment to peace and grace. Our scripture for this morning invites us to learn something new, to mature in our faithful practice. Rather than rage, rebel, and revert back to the old ways of being, let us step forward into a new future, to a new future where the hungry are fed, where the suffering are relieved, and where the oppressed do go free. May it be so. Amen. Let us hold a moment of silence. Good morning, friends. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we pray today for God's people throughout the world, for our church leadership, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. We pray for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. We pray for our nation, for healing 
unity, and justice. We pray for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. I ask your prayers especially for Betsy, Susan, and Steve, as well as for all of those affected by the coronavirus. We pray for those in any need or trouble. We pray for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. We pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for the departed, for those who have died. We thank you and praise you, God, for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. And we pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Let us join together in the prayer Christ taught to his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our offering is an act of worship. It is our proclamation that God is indeed at work among us, that God is present with us, nurturing us, growing our faith in us, ushering us and the whole world towards well-being, towards healing, towards restoration. The act of giving an offering is our participation an expression of our commitment that we as individuals and that we as a community are a part of the redeeming and resurrecting ministry of Jesus Christ that is active and alive in the world today. To give, you can visit the church website or you can simply click the My Gift to Give link in the email where you found this worship link. Or you can text the number that will appear at the bottom of your screen. However you give, please give generously to the ministry and mission of Jesus Christ at work in the world. Through our giving, we boldly declare that our God is a God of grace. Our God is a God of peace, a God of justice, and our God is still in our midst, still creating new life, still leading humanity towards abundant life. Our morning offering will now be received.
Holy and gracious God, we thank you for these gifts, for all the gifts of life that you bestow upon us. We give back a small portion, but we pray, O oh God, that this portion will be magnified for your love. Grant us wisdom to be good stewards of these gifts. And may the whole world know your peace. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Church, as you go out into the world, be predictable. Consider how you are predictable of Christian living, of loving your neighbor, of loving God. And go out into the world with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit this day and forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen.